Thank you very much for that presentation. Our next presenter this afternoon is Russell Evans, who is going to talk about Matt's compliance plan for the Owensboro Municipal Utilities Elmer Smith Station, if I got all that correct. Uh, so we're getting some case studies this afternoon on how things are working uh, and the challenges that are being faced. So with that, have it up. Good afternoon. <clears throat> okay, so Elmer Smith Station has two units. We have a unit one, which is a 151 mega, uh, megawatt BNW, BNW Cyclone unit. Uh, for air pollution controls, we have uh, for NOx, uh, overfire, and an SCR. For particulate, we have a Willebrader ESP, and then for particulate and SO2, we have a uh, Willebrader wet FGD. Uh, it is a wet limestone porous oxidation scrubber. It has two 60% absorber modules, which are common to both units. Unit two is a 282 megawatt TE fired. Built in 1974. For uh, NOx, we have uh, separated over fire air, low NOx burners, and an SNCR. <coughs> and the particulate's the same, an ESP from Willebrader, and then our common FGD for particulate and for SO2. There we go. Okay, all of our coal is Southern Illinois Basin coal. It comes within six, it comes from a local mine struck in about a 60 mile radius. Uh, so it's very economical for us. Uh, a couple of things, though, that are challenges for us, I call it the uh, trifecta of bad coal. We have high sulfur, which really stays more around the 4%. We have very low chlorine, so we don't get a lot of native oxidation on our mercury. And then our mercury is, can be very high, as you can see. So our compi compliance challenges that we identified early on were the uh, low chlorine, high sulfur, high mercury coal that we have. Our ESPs have very little margin on them. And then we experience re-emission in our wet FGD. So same for both units. And on unit one, at least we had the SCR for oxidation. On unit two, we do not have an SCR, so get no additional oxidation of our mercury for unit two. In uh, 2006, the Institute for Combustion Science and Environmental Technology, or ICSET from Western Kentucky, came in and did a mercury study at our plant. And basically, this is the first time we identified that we actually had mercury emission. So as you can see, when they did the uh, total stack oxidized mercury, it was much higher than the inlet mercury of the FGD. And in fact, with the SCR on, we saw an increase of 60%, and with it out, 256%, so it made a a rather large difference. Okay. So in 2012, we con contracted with Sergeant Lundy to do an uh, environmental compliance study and develop a plan. And some of the key takeaways for the MATS compliance were, first we looked at our cost prohibitive solutions. We identified fuel switching is definitely not an option for us due to our location for either unit. We also set, looked at full ACI DSI with a bag house as a solution, but uh, we're, we're a small unit, about 440 megawatts, so each of those would cost us about 60 million per unit to, to add those, so that, that really wasn't a good option for us financially. And then adding an SCR unit two was gonna be around 50 million, so that really wasn't a good op option for us there either. So we started looking at potentially low cost solutions alternatives. We found three areas on unit one, we figured by adding a highlight, a, some sort of halide on unit one on the coal for oxidation, also increasing the oxidation potential across our SCR by keeping good catalyst layers or possibly looking at the higher uh, mercury oxidation type catalysts like the track or the, uh, or uh, Cormatex, uh, I forgot the name of it, but anyway. Also uh, stopping mercury emission in our, oops, in our wet FGD, thing's got a tricky button. On unit two, though, basically our only two opportunities look like adding halide and stopping a re-emission. And one other thing that we're looking at is, is setting a mercury limit max on our coal delivered to plan. I'm not sure how it's going to work out, but we'll see. So we started off by doing four different additive tests. Uh, the first test we did was with Shaw. We tried their EMO. Our second test was with Nalco, and we tried their Mer control. 785 and 8034 combination. 
Our third test was the awesome STIA combination, and then our last test was again with NALCO. Um, the two I'll discuss during this one will be the two NALCO tests. So our test plan was to inject 7895 during our first test with NALCO, and what we were looking at was inject it directly on the feeders for both units and looking for brominating or LOI or unburned carbon and capturing it on precips, and then also oxidizing the mercury up to 90% to get better efficiency removal out of the wet FGD, and then injecting the 8034 in order to block the re-emission. So this was our setup, the uh, 7895 on the feeders, and then the NALCO 8034 on the FGD, and then we ran uh, inlet sims at the common duct and an outlet sims at the location. And we ran a few traps to verify that the sims were, were working good. So this was our baseline. And what you'll notice is, besides we were running really high mercury during the test, is we definitely, with the FGD inlet versus the stack elemental, we're seeing rear emission during the whole baseline. Now during the test, right back in here, we started dosing the uh, uh, 7895 for oxidation and driving down the uh, elemental. And then I think right around here is where the FGD additive started. And we worked our way down to the lowest we could get was around, I think 2.45 micrograms, which was not quite the 1.6, but we got close. What we found was we were able to oxidize 90% of our mercury uh, with the uh, 7895. We were able to stop re-emission, but one, we weren't getting the oxidation off unit twos because with the lack of SCR, that wasn't helping us, and we were running re relatively high mercury, so we just could not get there. So we all sat down together and came up with a, a second plan. So our second test, which was a longer test, we still use the 7895 on, the, on, on all the coal feeders and, and the re-emission blocker. But on unit two, we added uh, hydrated lime at the economizer outlet for SO3 mitigation. And then we injected brominated pack on air heater outlet to help knock down the, uh, uh, the mercury. But we only want to use a, a volume for trimming, not as a full-blown system. And then we also put mercury sims and traps again, and, but we also added breen probes at their here outlets to monitor SO3 concentrations. And this was the setup for the second round of testing. So the feeders, the ASI, or DSI and the ACI, breen probes, and then the NALCO re-emission blocker. And we did run traps and sims. So this was our baseline again. For the second round of testing, we were around, we switched over pounds per trillion on this test, but right around 20 was, was pretty common. This was dropping load. And we did verify that we were still having re-emission issues. So day one was baseline. And in day two, we kind of took a strategy of first, we wanted to try and get there with just brominated carbon, 7895 and 8034. So we tried that for about days two through seven. And what we found was we, we did finally get there, but the amount of 7895 and the amount of carbon we were having to eject, the, the, it was just too much volume. But on day nine, we tripped unit one, or sorry, unit two, which allowed us to monitor unit one for a day. And we, we did notice that we were able to get below the match limit with unit one with just the 7895 and 8034. So we did definitely identify that during that time period. So day 10 through 12, we decided to add the DSI and with it, with the brominated carbon and the 7895 and 8034, we were able to get below the 1.2 consistently. I'll show you those numbers. So here we were started off running with eight pounds and the 7895 at a constant and lime, we started cranking up the lime and knocking the SO3 down. And then we started backing off the carbon Pretty soon, it just became uh, relevant that, you know, the more lime we put in, the more, less pack we could use. We did a little bit of work or trimming with the 7895, but finally, I think this was our 
area we figured was going to be our primary sweet spot for a reduction. So, as you can see, we did pretty consistently get below the limit. This led us to our current compliance plan that we're currently putting into place. We will be injecting the Merck Control 7895 on our coal feeders, individual feeders. We will be uh, injecting the 8034 in our absorber. We will be injecting hydrated lime on unit two only, economizer outlet. We will be, we'll be injecting brominated pack. Our SIMS, we will put on the stack, but we're only gonna use the SIMS on the stack for controlling issues to try and decide instantaneously if we're having some problems with one of our additives. And our, for compliance, we're gonna do 30B traps. And we will contract our PM and ACL testing out for compliance. I think I skipped a slide. I did, it jumped one on me. Just so you know, for PM and ACL testing during that, we did contract with Grace Consulting <laughs> They did do a method five test for particulate, and we were well under the particulate limit. We were at 0.07, limit was 0.03. And then for acid gases, we did, they did a method 26A, and our average was way under the uh, ACL limit. So we did confirm that we met all the match requirements. All right, anybody got any questions? Not a single question. One question, two questions, now we're talking. <laughs> so the They're acceptable considering our alternatives. We, uh, we were, I think our estimates are around total six million for capital and about six million on them. Uh, what levels of SO3 did you measure around the, at the air heater inlet and outlet? Did you mention that? Man, I don't, I don't have that number with me, but they're really high. I mean, we, we have really high levels of SO3, uh, both units. The method 17 particulate measurements you made were at the stack or following the precipitator? At stack. Did you notice any impact on precipitator performance from the additional burden of hydrated lime and, and mer or, excuse me and pack that you were putting it in we did see a little bit of a you know spike in the in the energy usage on the uh but it wasn't much and they did keep up and uh we did in uh, actually came offline i think the following week and did an inspection of all both esps and there was no bad buildup or corrosion or anything on any of the plates so we were pretty happy with that up here in the front <laughs> John Meyer with Nelco just to add to Russ's presentation there was a, a question about the economics of the solution uh, Russ's unit the the OMU unit 2 the the one without an SCR really I think for the industry is the most expensive uh, configuration the fact that you can't get enough oxidation you have to add pack, you have a high SO3 environment, and then coupled with the high mercury coal as well, that's why you see the compliance costs go up. So this is kind of the worst case scenario. Yeah, we were definitely a challenge. Everybody that tested there, um, it, was, it was tough. All right, you're free to go. All right.